Well, we want to uh, welcome each and every one of you that are with us here on campus and tell you how much we appreciate you coming out. What a beautiful day it turned out to be. Um, and then for those of you that are watching through any one of our social media platforms, again, welcome. Uh, best, the best way to be part of His Grace Church is to be here. But if you can't, the second best way is to check us out online. And so, um, man, a lot of good things happening here. Uh, we're going to continue this morning in our preemptive series, amen, on faith. Um, I've actually titled it Faith Speaks, Faith Has a Voice. This morning, I want to talk to you about the command that we as believers are to live by faith. It doesn't, doesn't say we're to act in faith. It doesn't say that, you know were to use our faith, it says we are to live faith. And so uh, I've titled this morning's message, The Just Shall Live by Faith. And we'll look at all these words within this particular statement as we uh, do our study this morning. But let's just open with a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts, thanking you for the gift of this day, and the opportunity to gather in your name. Father, as we begin this lesson this morning, we ask for your presence to be with us. I ask you to open our hearts and our minds to receive your word and to understand the depths of your love and the truth that's found within it. And Lord, as we explore this subject matter of the just shall live by faith, um, help us to deepen our trust in you. Grant us the wisdom and discernment to grasp the significance of the scriptures that we're studying this morning. Let your Holy Spirit guide our lesson so that we may grow in your faith and apply it to our daily lives as well. And Father, I pray this morning. I pray for those among us who are struggling with doubt and are even facing challenges right now. That you'll strengthen their faith today. And remind them of your promises and your unfailing love. And then help us to support and encourage each other as we walk in, in this journey of faith together as a body of believers. Now, Lord, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp under our feet and a light to our path. May it illuminate our way, transform our hearts. And I thank you this morning that I, as I proclaim your word, that I'll not just speak with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost. Yes. I thank you for revelation, understanding, and discernment. I thank you for ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to be receptive to the word, that we just not be hearers only, but we're doers of what we've learned and what we hear this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. So, again... You know, we started an impromptu series about five weeks ago, right in the middle of our tithing series. But, you know, we, we, we follow the Holy Ghost. And there's a reason for that because all of us, I don't know about you, but there are just seems to be seasons in life where um, situations, and I don't want to use the word difficulties, but situations, attacks arise. Um, and we have to come back and know who we are in Christ. We have to come back and understand how our faith supplies what we need. And so it's important that when we're going through these times of difficulties, as Paul says, tests and trials, Jesus called them afflictions, that we know what we're to do. You know, the Bible says, now thanks be unto God who always causes me to walk in defeat. Right? right. That's right. <laughs> well, I'm going to come over here and preach to this side. <laughs> It always causes us to triumph in what? Victory. Victory. Now, thanks be unto God who always, sometimes, maybe, hopefully, no, always causes us to triumph in victory. If we're going to walk in that victory, we're going to have to know, number one, who we are in Christ. Number two, how victory operates. Victory always operates through faith. And so when there's tribulation and trial, What's important, as we found out over the last several weeks, is how our mouth plays a decisive factor in which direction that we're going to go. Yeah. Are we going to walk in the blessings of God or not? 
The Bible says in, in Proverbs, the power of life and death are in the tongue, yeah. your tongue. God talking to the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy, he says, life and death, blessing and cursing, yeah. you choose. The choice is yours. Yeah. And he facilitates the law of faith in our life so that we can make proper choices. But you have to get the word active because the word of God, it says in Hebrews, is alive, active. It's not dead. God's alive. He's active. He's actively working in your life. So his word is active. Yeah. Now the King James, this is how I learned it, so I'm going to, I'm going to quote it from the King James, piercing the dividing asunder of your spirit, your soul, yeah. and your body. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's right. That's right. The word of God has enough authority, has enough power to go into you to, to discern your thoughts, right. to discern your heart, to create change in your body, to create change in your life, to create change in your finances. The Bible says in Mark, we've looked at this, chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, tw chapter 11, verse 23, 24, and 25 says, Now, uh, that's, not, that's Hebrews chapter 11, 1. Now faith is. It says, Speak to your mountain. Be removed. Be cast into the sea. Who's speaking? You're speaking. Yeah. Amen. When you speak, you're using your voice. You're not transcending it in meditation and in it through your mind. You are speaking it. It's a vocal process. Your voice is declaring to your mountain. I can't declare something to my wife. Now, many times after so many years of marriage, they can kind of pick up what you're thinking. And, and, but unless I declare something to my wife, like get in the car, let's go. We're late for church. She's not going to realize that I'm ready. Amen? Amen? I'm hungry. Feed me. I'm making a declaration. Get your job done, woman. <laughs> but you see, the point, the point is, I am declaring something. Unless I speak to my wife, she's not going to have comprehension of the need or what I'm asking of her. It's the same is with it's true with the same with, it's true with the word of God. You're declaring the word of God. I'm declaring. The Bible says, I believe it's in Galatians, that um, we are to call those things that be not as though they already existed. I'm speaking to things that don't exist, causing them to come into the reality of the real. That's what faith is, according to Hebrews chapter verse. I'm so far ahead of myself, my mouth's got to catch up. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is, hallelujah, is what? It is the substance, the substructure of those things you're hoping for. Hope is the happy expectation of something good to come. And I tell you, something good to come is every one of my bills paid off, my cars are paid off, my house is paid off. Hallelujah. I have excess money in my checkbook. When I look at it, I'm not having to go to Peter to see if Paul can get paid. <laughs> right. Amen. Whatsoever things I desire when I pray, believe that I have them. And, and Jesus said I would have them. So faith is the substructure, the substance of the things that I'm hoping for. And, and how I bring those from the realities of the, the unseen into the seen is through calling them into existence. Yes, right. Now, I have animals. I've had dogs most of my life. Sometimes on, on, when we're out on the ranch, the dogs would disappear. They'd get out in the field. I couldn't see them. You ever had, an, you know, maybe you let your dog out or your cat out. And you, well, I've never called my cat. It's never come. It comes when it wants to come. But my dog, on the other hand, it's pretty obedient. I don't know much about horses. That, they just follow me around. Food. Oh, look, the food god is here. <laughs> food monkeys. And so, anyways, I got off track. So faith, then, is the substructure. So when I can't see that dog and I need it to come, what do I do? I call it by name. And it's out in the field somewhere, but when it hears my voice, number one, it recognizes my voice. Now, you can call my dog all you want. It ain't coming. I'll tell you that because it doesn't recognize your voice. Faith, your faith recognizes your voice. Your mountains recognize 
your voice. Amen? And so as I call that dog and I tell it to come, that dog comes. I have trained it to come. And so I can't see it, but I know when I call that dog, it's coming. How do I know that? Well, I have trust. It, it's been proven to me time and time again that when I call her, she'll come. Faith works the same way. When you speak it out, now, I'm not, call, I'm not saying the dog, oh, 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 now my dog's name is Sophie, you know that. Oh, Sophie, please come. Well, Sophie, come, come, come on, Sophie, please, don't make me come get you. What do I say? Sophie, come. Yes. Right. See, now that's a command of authority. Sophie, sit. Hallelujah. I'm calling you, man. <laughs> you keep calling. Yes, amen. Keep calling. He may just come someday. <laughs> and so, you, you, you see, sometimes we're, we're, when we speak our faith, we're, we're, we're talking to it like we're hoping it's going to, uh, you know, Sophie, would you come here, please? I'm hoping you'll just come. I'm hoping you'll just do what I ask you to do. No, no, I'm, I'm commanding. It's an order. Come, now, sit, roll over, eat, whatever. Hallelujah. It's a, and so we have to speak with that same authority and expectancy as I do with my dog. I know it's a loose trans, you know, illustration, but it's the same way. A lot of us are just hoping that when we speak, all right, body be, if you want to be healed, please, please, pain be gone. Oh, okay, it's maybe tomorrow. But that's, that's not the way it works. When faith speaks, it's a declaration of authority. And when you speak under the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus, the Bible tells us of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things beneath the earth must or shall bow its knee. When Jesus spoke to the fig tree in Mark chapter 11, that was, he didn't say, um, golly, I hope uh, tomorrow when I come by, you'll obey my command. He spoke with authority. He said, from this day forward, you will never eat. Uh, uh, there, no man shall ever eat of the fruit of your tree again. What's he doing? He's speaking to a tree. Yeah, yeah. How many, as I told you last week, if you and I went to the tree and start talking to a tree, we'd be on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. What about when he spoke to the storm in the boat? And then he, turned, then he turns and to his disciples said, man, oh, ye of little faith. He didn't say you didn't have any faith. But if you have the faith the size of the grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea. It does, he's showing us it don't take a lot of faith to move a mountain. Right. Amen. Amen. Because the mustard seed in the agricultural industry is one of the smallest seeds you possibly can have. Except, I guess, a lettuce seed. Man, those are really small. Right? But what he's saying is, if you have just a little faith, you can still move a mountain. But how are we adhering to moving our mountain? Are we kind of begging with it? It's like with our kids when they were young. Oh, eat your peas, please. <laughs> no, that ain't going to work. Come on. Airplane mode. Right? Is that what we're trying to do with our faith? Or, you know, now when the kids get older, you just say, sit down and eat. Well, I don't want to eat that. Too bad. If you don't want it, too bad. You can fix yourself something else, but I ain't fixing it for you. Why? Because they age to the place there's responsibility and understanding within their, in their thought process that they can make decisions. Right. You have to make a decision that no matter what, faith is the ultimate resource that God has given you to receive the promises. And when you apply your faith, just the small amount of faith, you can move a mountain. So the just shall live by faith. Again, when we look at faith, the principle of faith is a foundational piece of our Christian existence or life because it's, as it's emphasized in Ephesians, or Ephesians, 
Hebrews 11, 1, it says the substance, the substructure of our faith or the substance of things hoped for is the evidence of things not seen. Those hopes, those realities, the happy expectation of something good to come that you are not seeing immediately right this moment is what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11, 1 uh, in the Amplified says, faith is the title deed. Now, I, I taught on this last week. If you weren't with us last week, I'd go back and take a good listen to it because I've meditated on it all week. In fact, I've meditated on to the point now where that, that gives me ownership. See, I come at it, just that, just, just that message last week gave me some new insight in my own life. I have ownership of it. So those things which I'm believing God for, I'm not looking for the future tense to show up. I own them. You see, when I have ownership of something, you can't take it away from me. You can't tell me it's not mine. I own it. I own several cars that are parked in my garage right now. Can I see them? No. Can you? No. How do you know I have them? Because I just told you I have them. They're mine. But I also have a piece of paper that says, mine. M-I-N-E. Paid in full. I have what they call the pink slip, right? I own it. I have the title. You can't tell me it's not mine. I have that assurance. I have that conviction. I have the title deed. I have the legal piece of paper that says I own it. It's mine. And so no matter what you tell me, pastor, it's not really yours. Oh, really? Who's telling you that? Well, you know, so-and-so down at so-and-so said so-and-so. It's like, you know, healing's not really yours. Who told you that? Satan. Oh, okay. But yet you've got a title deed from Jesus that says it's mine. It's mine. I own it. I have it. It's in my garage. You may not be able to see it right now, but it's, it's in my garage. I, it's mine. You see, we have to come to the same determination and understanding that when, when God speaks something through the Word of God, and we take ownership of it because He said it's ours already, when, when Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law... It says in Galatians chapter 3, is it verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, curses everyone that hangs upon a tree, that the blessings yeah. of Abraham might have come upon me, a Gentile, right? right? Come upon you, a Gentile. What's a Gentile? One, it's a person who's not a Jew. You see, Jews were God's covenant children. And until Jesus came, the Gentiles were outside of the covenant. But thanks be unto God that when Jesus came and he died upon that cross and he rose from the dead and he went into hell and stripped Satan of all his authority and power and then turned it around and gave it unto us. Hallelujah. I am now the redeemed. I have been ransomed out. I have been brought into a covenant with God. And so I'm a covenant child of God through the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I have a right to stand up. I have a right to declare. And I have a right to walk as a king and a priest. Not because of who I am, but because of who I am in Christ Jesus. The blood speaks. It has power to redeem. It has power to wash sin away. It has power to make anew. It has power to restore and to bring to life those things that were dead in your life. So rise up. Rise up and take your position and place in Christ. And so when you begin to speak and declare the promises of God, you have to know that it's already yours. Because if it's not, you'll just give it away. Because if I come, I'm, I like using Tom because Tom doesn't give me any grief, usually. If I come to Tom's house and, and I tell him I'm coming to reclaim your tractor, he'll say, what do you mean reclaim it? Well, I'm just going to start calling it mine. 
John chapter 10, verse 10 says, Satan is a thief who comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's what Jesus said he was. He's a liar. Everything he says to you is a lie. So if I come to Thomas and told Tom, well, your tractor is my tractor now, what would he tell me? You lying dog. That's my tractor. How do I know it's your tractor? I got a piece of paper that says it's mine. What would happen if I went and, and tried to put that tractor on a trailer and say, you know what, it may be yours, but I'm still taking it. Yeah. Well, he may call the sheriff. Yeah, Tom would shoot me, that's definite. <laughs> you know Tom too well. He would protect what was rightfully his by any means. Can we say it that way? And then after he's done doing what he's going to do, then I have to face the legal repercussions because Tom ain't going to let it just kind of go away. He's going to make sure I go away. Right? So when it comes, think about that. Just think about that analogy. Because Jesus paid a price. He took back death, eternal death. He took that back. He took back sickness. He paid the price to abolish sickness and disease. He paid the price to abolish poverty and lack. He removed all that, right, from our life. Because under the curse of the law, if you look at the curse of the law, that was all included. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 16, 61 says, All manner of sickness and disease is under the curse. Does that mean diabetes is under the curse? Yeah. Does that mean cancer is under the curse? Yeah. Does that mean your little flu is under the curse? Yeah. Oh, I just, a, just a little bit of allergies. Well, you know, I, I don't really have to deal with it because, hey, it's not that bad. Yeah, yeah, you keep thinking that way. It's like me coming up to Tom and taking the tire off his tractor, and the next week I'm coming back for the other tire, and then the next week the other tire. Eventually I'll get the transmission, the motor, the chassis, all one little piece at a time. And one day he'll walk out there and wonder, where'd my tractor go? Huh? Right? See how, that's exactly how Satan works. Oh, got a little sniffles. Ah, no big deal. Uh, got the flu. Well, okay, that's a little tougher. Cancer. Ooh, better start believing God now. You need to start with the sniffle. Whiffle? Well, Mr. Whiffle, well, a Whipple. It was Mr. Whipple. <laughs> Mr. Whipple. <laughs> he had the sniffles. <laughs> and so we need to start at the first sign that the enemy has come to take something that doesn't rightfully belong to him. And that's your health. Your health doesn't matter what size the health bucket comes in. Because if he can get you at the sniffle, then he can eventually get you at diabetes. He can eventually get you at cancer. He can eventually get you at whatever. Because you'll, you'll have already succeeded your authority to the fact that Nothing you can do. But the reality of it is, Jesus already paid a price through his life, shed his blood, so that you could walk above and not beneath. You're the head and not the tail. You're the top and not the bottom. That's what he's already done. He's, you know, we're, we're praying to Jesus. Oh, Jesus, help me. Help me. I'm in trouble. Help me. And what's he tell us? I've already done everything I can do. I've already fulfilled the covenant. I've already fulfilled. You need to walk in what is rightfully yours, what you have ownership of, what you have the title deed of. It's already been given unto you. So own it, possess it, walk in it. Oh, do you know how difficult that is? No. Just because we have opposition to the word of God doesn't mean that we are not victorious. And you're going to have to learn to walk in the victory before you can even see the victory. Yes. Right? That's right. Amen. 
And I'm telling you that the, that the enemy is going to try to, to view your failures as victories. And it's going to look like your mountains are too big. Too big, too much, too high. This lack that I'm in, it'll, it'll never turn around. It'll never be different. It's always going to be this way. Yeah, it will. I'll guarantee you that. Because for, for a nutshell, you can have what you say, what you believe in your heart, what you speak out of your mouth. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. Yes, What's in your heart is going to come out of your mouth, whatever it is, whatever you're saying. I mean, I, I, I've had to really go back in the last, in, within this series and just, what am I saying? Am I speaking life or death? Right. Well, you know, our, our words, are, they're not really that important. You know, I didn't really mean what... You, the Bible doesn't say it whether you mean it or not. It says the power of life and death is in the, is in the tongue. Right. The power of life and death. I can see we're not going to get far in this, this subject matter. We'll pick this back up next week. But we, we, we seem to be in this subject, and there's a reason we're in this subject, is because I'm going to tell you something. Now, as your pastor, I hear what people say. Yeah. Yeah. You say, you listening? Yes, I'm listening. <laughs> you ask me a question, you think, yeah, I'm listening. You know, because I, 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 sometimes just through, you know, you need prayer, you know, sometimes you need help. So, yeah, it's not like what I, what I do with Pastor Kim. You know what I mean by that? She's talking to me, and I'm off over here somewhere. Why? Because I'm so comfortable with her, so familiar with her voice, I can pick it up in my mind. <laughs> huh? So let's go, back. Let's, let's, let's go back and review some of these things. So it's important that we, that we, that we get this, because I think we're going to stay here until we do. Our words. So I, 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 and here's something that I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I still hear it, but it's something that, that the Lord corrected me of some time ago, years ago, and I'm going to help some of you with this, because when, when we have, when doctors give us diagnosis, those are facts. It's a fact. Now, you're not going to sit there and tell the doctor, hey, you're wrong. He's going to say, you're an idiot. But, I'll give you an example. Hold my thought for me, would you? Back at the turn of the century, seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? 22 years, 24 years. Almost a quarter of a century has gone since, you know, Y2K. Remember Y2K? Everything was going to die. We all had to run out and buy everything to survive. New Year's Day. Well, every, it seems like every year people have survived New Year's Eve. <laughs> and so, at the turn of the century, I, I began to have panic attacks. And so, in, in doing so, finally, uh, I ended up having to see a psychiatrist. Well, I saw a, a primary, he was a young primary, and, and he put me on medication, and it whacked me out so much that by the time he got done with me, I need to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm seeing, beginning to see, that he was a good guy. Uh, and he kept telling me this, because we're talking about panic attacks. He said, this is something you're going to have to live with because it'll be with you for the rest of your life. And every time he said that on the inside of me, I'd say, oh, no, no, I don't accept that. See, he was giving me the facts. But the, the, my spirit was aligning with the word. No, that's wrong. But here's what I wanted to share with you. I did not tell him, you know, you're a quack. <laughs> you got that wrong. So over a process of probably almost a year, I began to apply the word. How did I begin to apply the word? I had to go find the scriptures that dealt specifically with fear, that specifically dealt with, and I had... A, 
I had probably four pages of the word that dealt with anxiety and fear and things. And I began to declare that. And he did. I, I've told you the story before. He put me on, on medication for, and for six months I was on medication. And the Lord told me after six months to come off the medication. And I want to say this specifically to you this morning. Unless the Lord deals with you, follow your doctor's advice. Okay? And so, because too many people, here's another story that I'll tie all this in. Too many people uh, try to come off medication before it's time. My brother, when we first got into what we call the faith message, name it and claim it bunch, we were believing God for his eyesight. See, he, he wore glasses so he could see anything. And so, one day he said, you know, I'm healed. And we were taught, well, if you're healed, then you act like it. So he, so he took his glasses off and quit wearing them and still continued to drive. And it was necessary for us to remind him we wanted to live a long and prosperous life. Please put your glasses on because you can't see the car in front of you. See? Now, there's a difference because as he continued to declare the word, I believe his eyesight would have cleared up. And then as it cleared up, then, then you right. make the admins. And so <clears throat> for, the, for all that time, I'm going to the psychiatrist twice a month, you know, once a month, I don't know. You know, every time I see him, well, it's going to be like this forever. And, uh, you know, I just tell him, no, it's not on the inside of me. I didn't tell him, no, it's not. And so and eventually, there came a place at about a year. Did you know that I, I was off all medication, no panic attacks? And he finally released me. And in the, really, in the last session that I was in, I was counseling him. Amen. And then, then you can give your testimony. Yeah. Then you can give your testimony. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that's how I was able to minister to him. When I had my heart issues, and my heart was beating irregularly. I didn't go to the specialist and tell him he was wrong. I just continued to apply the Word of God until the manifestation of what I was declaring, speaking into existence, came into existence. And then he wanted to know what I did. Well, there's the door. But I didn't go in there and tell him, your prognosis of my heart is wrong when it's doing all this stuff. But you have to, you have to sometimes... Keep your mouth silent, in, you know, with the medical professionals until the proof's in the pudding, because they're scientists. And then you can tell them, because the, the evidence is there that what shouldn't be working is now working. And so, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So we come back to them, we are snared with the words of our mouth, and we are taken captive with the words of our mouth. That's Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Again, when we speak, it's like with the dog. When I speak to that dog, I'm not expecting it not to come. Sometimes I think what's happening is when we speak in faith to our mountain, we're not expecting it to obey our voice. We're just even, sometimes I think we're even wondering if it hears our voice. Say it, say it. So let me, let me go back to this other portion of the story. You thought I forgot, didn't you? So here's something that I used to do on a regular basis that the Lord corrected me. And I'm going to share this with you because I, I hear some of these things even uh, from within the house. Yes. When we have sickness and disease, sometimes we take ownership. And I'll give you an example. I'm going to use diabetes. Uh, it could be cancer. I don't, I mean, but you know, what do we say? My diabetes. Yeah. Well, when'd you take ownership of it? Yeah. When'd you take possession of it? Because the moment you do, it, it, it is yours. Jesus can't take something away from you that you've already declared that you have legal possession of. And so when we talk about these things, and this is how the Lord helped me. I have, I have circumstances that are in my body that are contrary to the Word of God. That's a fact. But that's not the truth. You say, would you just lie? I says, no. The truth is what the Word of God says. And the facts always have to line up with the truth. 
And so if the facts and the truth are out of alignment, then you're going to have to begin to declare the truth until the facts realign. It's just that simple. And it will realign. That's why business and corporations do it all the time. They call it a realignment. Hallelujah. They're moving resources around. They're realigning resources to meet the need. The Word of God is going to realign the resources, in your, if we're talking about health, in your physical body to meet the need of what you're declaring. So if you're declaring that, uh, you know, that my pancreas produces the proper amount of, of insulin, that my kidneys and my liver function, then as you declare that, and, and, you, and, and, you, and you speak to your glucose levels, and, you know, uh, that, that they're in normal healthy ranges at all times. As you declare that, you got to expect that. You can't say it and not believe it. That's a double-minded man. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unstable. Doesn't have a foundation. We'd say it like this, don't have a leg to stand on. Amen. And so when you call, how many of you have a phone? Just out of curiosity, anybody in here have a cell phone? <laughs> anybody don't have a cell phone? When you dial in a number, you're making a call. <laughs> you want to get up here and preach this? What are you expecting? You're expecting the person you're calling to answer. Not their voicemail. Right. Hi, this is Faith. Please leave a message, and when I have time, I'll get back to you on your healing. <laughs> right? No. When you speak, when you are picking up that phone, you're expecting, or you could say maybe you're hoping, you might start out and hope, like sometimes I'll call Pastor Mark, you know, I hope that he's going to pick up that phone, and then he does. And it becomes, now faith is. I'm hoping, hoping, I'm hoping to talk to Pastor Mark, the happy expectation of something good to come. So I dial his number. And when he actually picks up, now faith is. The substance, the substance of my hope. Does that make sense? Yes. My hope was that I'll talk, to, I can get to talk to Pastor Mark. But my, the moment he picks it up, my hope becomes a reality. Sometimes I have to, I have to use other, other alternative methods. My hope is that I can get a hold of Pastor Sandy to get a hold of Pastor Mark. <laughs> Amen? Because sometimes Pastor Mark's phone is somewhere. <laughs> is this making sense to you this morning? Yeah. Amen. So it's important that when, when we speak the Word of God... We have trust and confidence. How do we get the trust and confidence? How do, how do we get that same knowing? How many of you know this morning that are here that you're saved? You're born again? Yes. A couple of you. Good. The rest of you, we're going to pray for you right after service. <laughs> how many of you have that knowing? Just that knowing. Nobody can tell you that, hey, uh, heaven's not real. Jesus isn't real. Oh, really? How do you know? I know that I know because the Bible says that that same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, when I accepted him, he came to live on the inside of me to bear witness of that fact. I have a knowing. My knower knows. Hallelujah. You have to come to the same place with your faith and what you're trusting God that you know that you know that you know that it's yours. As I told you earlier with, with Tom, I bet he knows that that tractor is his. Right? What? <laughs> oh, he knows. He knows that that tractor's his. How does he know? Well, he has the title deed. Right. He has ownership of it. I can't convince him that that. I could gaslight him a little bit, but I can't convince him that that tractor's not his. He's got total ownership of it, and he has proof of ownership of it. And because of that, no matter what I say to him, I cannot convince him that that tractor's not his. 
Why is it when we come over into the realm of faith, we allow Satan to convince us that the promises of God, which are yes and amen, rightfully belong to us, aren't for us today? Aren't for you. It's for Pastor Mark, but Rebecca, no, nah, no, nah, you don't have the faith. You know what's happening is Satan is coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And those thoughts that are coming to your, your mind, in your head, you are agreeing with them, and you're thinking that that is, in fact, the truth because you have not renewed your mind to what the truth really is. Now I know that's steep, but that's still a good place to say amen. amen. You have not taken the time to renew your mind. How do we renew our mind? Well, let's say, let's say you're dealing with, with lack or you're, you're dealing with sickness. Let's just use sickness, right? Let's use lack, because right now in today's economy, I'm sure there's more than one person in this house that is having to walk through lack in their house. But you know, you don't have to walk through it. Right. Jesus right. gave you victory over it. Right. Your finances, if you tithe, if you're a tither and you're a giver, you are in covenant partnership. That's right. And I remind God, I think it says in Isaiah, he says, declare thou, right. put me in remembrance, declare thou that you may be justified. I put God in remembrance of His Word. I remind God of His promises to me, not because I'm trying to get something out of Him, but I'm trying to receive something He's already promised me. Yes, amen. See, there's a difference. People trying to get something out of you are trying to manipulate you. Yes. And I'll say this, there's a lot of church folks trying to manipulate God to get something that they haven't put any time or investment in. And God has given us ways to walk in the covenant. Financially, one way is to be a tither and a giver. Amen? He said, if you'll give, listen, I'll give back to you. Whew! You what? I'll give back to you. But I'm just not going to give back to you what you gave to me. I'll give back to you in a good measure. I'm going to give back to you so it's pressed down, shaken together, running over. Now listen. I did this as an experiment just not too long ago. I was, I was kind of meditating on this scripture, and so I, I did a little research on it. And uh, I went and got me some flour and a glass jar. And I put all that f much flour as that glass jar could hold. Mm -hmm. And then you know what I did next? I took and I started kind of banging it on the counter pressed down. And do you know that when I did that, that flower probably went down that much? Yes, yes. Well, what happened? I was able to put more in. That's right. Pressed down. Shaken together. Yes, becoming one. That's right. And then, and then as I, as I got it all compacted in there, that's, compaction means more. More. Than, as I'm you know, trying to dump the flour in there because now I can't just take it in there and scoop it. I got it all pressed down, shaken together. And I'm, I'm pouring that flour bag in there. And guess what happened? It overflowed. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, just take for a moment this thought process. What happens when you fill a cup too, too full? It overfulls, right? Does that water just stay right there by the cup? It goes everywhere. Think what happens when you're overflowing. Think about that. Think about the resources that begin to, to uh, go out of your household to provide into other people's household because you're overflowing. Hallelujah. You, you've got more than enough because you've got more than enough. You're able to, to substantiate and help. That's just a part of God's kingdom. He said that, you know, that he makes all grace abound toward us that we having a all sufficiency or a full sufficiency am able then to give unto a couple good works. Every good work. I'm looking for good works. Are you a good work? Some of you are going, I hope so. I'm a good work. I'll tell you that right now. If you're looking for something to sow into, I'm a good, my household is a good work. Amen. Hallelujah. We honor our God. I like this part. This scripture says, I was glad. 
I was happy. I was exceeding joyful when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Yeah. I can't wait. People say, oh, we go to church. I can't wait to come to church to see what God's going to do. Right. What God's going to say. Right. How God's going to move. Man, coming in a covenant partnership with him, I'm excited about what God's doing. So, if we're in Proverbs, let's go to another scripture. Let's go to Proverbs. Well, we got Proverbs chapter 12, verse 14. Now, I know that we've looked at all these scriptures over and over and over the last probably month and a half, but I want these these scriptures, I want this word to get into you because the word is alive. It's active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Notice verse 14 of Proverbs chapter 12. A good man, or woman, it's not gender neutral, shall be satisfied with, the, with good by the fruit of his mouth. If you're not satisfied right now with your life, check your mouth. Well, that'd be a good title for a sermon. Check your mouth. I bet that gets some. It's like saying, shut up. You put that out on the internet, everybody, will, hey, what's he talking about? So check your mouth, right? Because you'll be sad. What? Put it in check. Put it in check. Yeah, write me a check. That's, I like that. <laughs> put it in check. Put your mouth in check. In other words, check what you're saying. You can't be just saying all kinds of little. And let me, let me, just, let me just meddle here. Can I meddle for a moment? Yes. Now, I know we all have different genres of music styles we like. I do. And I know music moves the soul. <laughs> but be careful what you are singing the lyrics to. You ever notice a lot of the songs from the 70s, 80s, and 90s? I'm crazy for you. Yeah. I'm just going crazy. <laughs> Hallelujah. You make me crazy. Well, pastor, yeah, but those words don't have any power. Oh, really? Oh, really? A good man shall be satisfied by, by good fruit. I'll give you an example of craziness. And I'm not looking at anybody, trust me. My grandmother, as long as I can remember, she, she would, you know, now, you have to understand there's different diagnoses like ADHD that, you know, the brain just works differently, right? And like with ADHD, one of the things that we've learned is that in your frontal cortex is where your short-term memory is operational. Sometimes it don't work just right, right? And so it gives, it gives the effect that there's a deficient uh, in your memory, which is not true. It's just instead of, instead of it working as the butler, it's working as, you know, I don't know, it's not working. <laughs> and so the way ADHD people work is they work out of building memory through emotions. Mm -hmm. Okay? Good emotions, bad emotions. That's how they, like with me. How I remember names, I have to tie you to somebody. Yes. So, like with Tom, I tied him to my friend Tom. He was easy, Tom Tom. <laughs> right? I'm, some of you, I'm not even going to tell you what I tie you to. <laughs> but that's how I remember names. I make it a point. Yes. I make it a point to tie it to something yes. that builds a memory. And so my grandmother, I think, you know, this was back, now you got to remember, this is back before all this science was available because they do scans on people with ADHD, PTSD, and the brain scans now show that there's deficiencies. They can see that there's abnormalities. That doesn't mean that that's God ordained, all right? It doesn't mean that it can't be changed. It just means that you now know that there's a starting point. And so... But my grandmother, I believe maybe she had a little ADHD because she was always stumbling over names. She only, there was five, six, seven of us grandkids. And, you know, now if you're the oldest, it generally you, she started on top and worked her all her way down until she got to your name. And every time she would do that, because let's, let's say she wanted to call me, she, and she might say, Frank, George, Harry, uh, John. Oh, Mike. Okay. And she, ah, oh, 
I'm just losing my mind. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, she, she did that for 45 years before she actually lost her mind. She called those things, and her, she was, oh, man, you want to talk about smart? I mean, now she was sassy. Whew. But she was, she, man, she was, she was a smart lady, very eloquent, great cook. She could cook. Back, you know, back, back then the ladies knew how to bake and cook. I mean, they did everything from scratch. It wasn't like, let's go to the store and see what we can get. <laughs> and so she, but over the years, she kept declaring that until it became a reality. And so the latter part of her life, the last five years of her life, she just couldn't remember anything and it had to be put in a home. So we have to be careful. Can we declare things into existence? Yeah. Yeah. Going back to Mark chapter 11, it says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray. That's not what I... And let me just go there. Because, you know, I think... Let's go to Mark chapter 11. Nettie, I know you're working on it, but I just wanted to let you know where I'm going. I think what happens is we quote the Scripture so often because we know it. I know it. I quote it every day. I live in it. I, I mean, but I think sometimes we just need to see it. And we need to put ourselves in remembrance of it. And that's why I encourage you, you know, bring a notepad, bring a Bible, bring, because as it, 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 this is a study session. This isn't a preaching session. This is a study session. This is, this is to help you develop and grow in the things of God, to become stronger spiritually, to be able to overcome the power of the enemy so that you are not blinded by his uh, attacks. So Mark chapter 11 says, have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. Oh, King James. I'm in the, oh, 22. I'm sorry. You're waiting on me. Just wave your hand and said, pastor, I'm waiting on you. 22. Now we're going to 23. He said, For truly I say unto you that, what, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, whatever mountain, whatever hindrance, whatever is risen up in front of you, you're going to have to climb over, be removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things that he says. See, my grandmother spoke something long enough and she began to believe it. And when it got down into it, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak. When it got into her heart, she began to move that mountain from health to sickness. Yeah. And a lot of people are moving their mountains from health into sickness yeah. by speaking words that are contrary to God's word. Right. We are to speak nothing but what supports our belief system, and that's God's word. You say, well, what, the doctor said this, the doctor said that. Well, you may have to tell people what the doctor said. That doesn't mean that you take it as a fact or a, the truth. It is a fact. It is a fact. But I know people who have walked out of cancer. I know people who have lived 27, 30 years after they were supposed to be dead. Six months into their cancer prognosis. God honors his word. God doesn't honor your word. He honors his word. So you need to speak his word. And you need to speak his word until it becomes the reality in your life. Until you see what you're believing for. Until you see what you're speaking for. Preach it. Preach it. And you need to stay consistent right. in what you're declaring. Amen. Not one moment it's all going to work out and the next moment we're all going to hell. <laughs> you see, you've got to get, you get downright... Real, determined, grizzly. Yeah. What, what was it? Bulldog. Bulldog. There's <laughs> bulldog. <laughs> well, that's, that's, a, that's a good analogy. Thank you. And because how many of you have been over to my house with my dog? She got a, she got a little rope string. Right? How many of you have ever played with her with that rope string? Or seen how when she gets a hold of that rope string, ain't nothing going to let it go. I actually got to come down here and find her release pattern under the, her throat, tickle her a little bit, and then she'll open her mouth. But other than that, it's not going to happen. 
She has got a hold of that and is not going to let it go. You need to get the same bold doggedness, bulldog faith, that when you get a hold of the promise, ain't nothing, we're going to say it South Texas, ain't nothing going to let you release from that. And then you just take it and drag it alongside of you because it's yours. That's her rope. And so, verse 24 says, Therefore I send you what things soever you desire when you pray. Believe that you have them, and you shall have them. Is what, how the Greek says it. You shall have them. Believe that you have them. And, well, I ain't got it yet. And, well, I'm a hoping someday it'll come in. You keep a hoping. Because that ain't faith. Faith says, I've got it. When I prayed, I believed, I received. Doesn't matter if I have the reality of it in my hand or not. I have ownership of it because it is mine, because Jesus already gave it to me. And because he already gave it to me, I'm going to act like it's already mine even before I see the or I have physical possession of it. You say, that's kind of like mind science. No, that's the faith. That's the Word of God. Flossie says this all the time, and, and she probably got it from somebody else, but it's still true. We, we need to act like the Word of God is true. And too many of us are acting like the Word of God might work for us. Might hopefully if we, if we just changle God's chain just the right way, put the right amount of quarters in the, in the jukebox, we'll get the right faith confession and song to come out, and God will mag just magnificently supply for our need. God's already supplied for every need that you already have, will have. Psalms chapter 23, verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not be in want. Jesus came, and he didn't just come for himself, he came for us. He came to bring us into covenant with the Father. We, covenant, let me put it to you in, in, in legal terms. He came and brought us into a contract with God. That's right. That's right. That contract cannot be broken. It is signed, sealed, and delivered. Do you know that even in today's, in today's uh, society, that if you break contracts, there's penalties? Yeah. And depending on how much that contract is broken, depending on how much penalty you get. Right. If I were to break the lease, did you know that I'm still liable? Oh, yeah. that's right. Just because we're not in the building, I still am liable for the amount that's owed. Because I'm in contract. Right. So you could break your portion of the contract, but God can't break his. He's liable. He's liable. And even if you're unfaithful in your portion of the contract, he'll still honor his side. It's a covenant relationship. It's a contract. And so when Jesus came and provided a way of escape for us from eternal separation, sickness and disease, lack and poverty... He gave us the ability to enter into a contract with him that says, I will take care of you. I will provide you. I will honor my word if you do your part. I will, he says, I will watch over my word to perform it. But if you're not sowing his word out over your life, he's got nothing to watch over to perform. If all you're doing is talking about how hard it is, how bad it is, how you don't have anything, how, oh, I can't get my bills paid, uh, you know, my, my boss is this, my job is that, hey, you're talking lack and doubt and unbelief, sickness and disease, you're going to live in that arena for a long time. But when you begin to realign there's that word that realign your mouth with your heart with God's word, you're going to see a difference. You're going to walk in greater degrees of, of, of victory because he's not having to perform a miracle to get you out of trouble. You know, a miracle, a miracle is a one-time event that only meets the need. 
specific need. And I'll give you an example. There's been a couple times we've needed financial miracles, and I'll just use this. Let's say I needed 50 bucks. Well, there's a couple times that, that, that we had a, a bill that come due that we didn't have money. And I mean, uh, so we're believing God, we're believing God. And, and let's say it was just 50 bucks. So somebody hands me a $50 bill. And that's exactly what, I, what my need is, right? Yes. And, and I always ask the Lord, now, wh how hard would it have been? Now, don't look at me in this tone of voice. <laughs> how hard would it have been to just add another $10 to that? Right. <laughs> Instead of just meeting the need, give me a little extra. Right. Right. All right? We've all been there. Right. But the miracle is only to meet the need. The blessings, though, is a lifestyle of overabundance, right. above and beyond. God didn't call us to live in the miraculous. He called us to walk and live in the blessings. And when we walk in the blessings, it acts like a miraculous aspect of our life. Yes. Good word, good word. I, I, I've just kind of gotten back to something I heard Jerry Savelle say a while back ago. You know, not only are our words are important, but they frame our world. Yes. Our world. And so I'm, I'm going back. I used to declare this every day. And, I, and now, that the favor of God rests upon me, that when I walk out of the door, something good's going to happen. Because God's favor. I, I, I'm highly fa favored of God. I'm favored in the city. I'm favored in the field. I'm favored when I come. I'm favored when I go. His favor. I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times His favor's got me a front row parking spot. Say, it's hot out here, Lord. I don't want to park. I mean, I go to H-E-B and, you know, by the house, and there's never any parking spots. They're all, I mean, you got to park like five miles from the store, and it's hot. That's right. Then you got to walk across that hot asphalt. And I'm going, I'm going, I'm going in there. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I'm parking right up front. And I can't tell you how many times just in the last couple of weeks, at the last moment, somebody's backing out of a front row seat. See, God's favor will work in other areas. It'll work at your work. It'll work at your business. It'll work to get your raises and promotions, bonuses and benefits. Yeah. Hallelujah. It'll open doors that no man can open because God's working on your behalf. But you need to declare it. You need to frame your world. You need to speak it. You need to walk in it. You need to act like it's already yours. Right. Instead of hoping that God will do something in the future when he's already done it in the past. Your blessings are past tense. Yes. Now, the reality of it is what you're believing and trusting God for may be still future, but you still have ownership of it now, and you need to act like it's so. Yes. Amen? Amen? You need to frame your world, which leads us back to my... Uh, let me just go ahead and teach this sermon now. <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to wrap this up with, with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, and we'll pick back up next week. The just shall live by faith. God's not asking us, well, would you please live by faith? He's commanding us to live by faith. Because if anyone draws back, it says, my soul will have no pleasure in them. To live by faith is not an option if you're going to live in success in the kingdom of God. Right. It's not an option. But we have gotten so off base and, and allow society to dictate how we're going to speak, what we're going to believe, what we're going to declare. That when it comes to the word of God, I'm telling you that, that we, we don't put any emphasis on the importance of speaking the word anymore. Declaring the word. The word ought to be first and foremost that comes out of your mouth in the times of tribulation and trials. The word ought to be first and foremost when the devil says, hey, you're never going to get healed of this. It may take some time, but you know what? The greater one's living on the inside of me. And anything the devil, anything that, that you hear in your head that is contrary to the word of God is not coming from God. It's coming from Satan himself. In the Bible, Jesus called him a liar and the chief liar of all liars. Anytime Satan opens his mouth, he's a lying to you. Anytime any circumstance rises that is contrary to the word of God, it's a lie. 
And you need, you need to speak to that lie. You can't just let it sit idle because he's bringing an accusation against you. He's bringing an accusation against God. He's bringing an accusation against your faith. And if you allow it to sit idle, you allow it to begin to fester on the inside of you. You know, the other day I went and picked some prickly pears for, for Pastor Kim because she wants to make some prickly pear or whatever. And I don't know if you know this, but these little cactuses have stuff on them. Yeah. And some of them are just... They're not, you know, the big ones, you know, well, you know to stay away from them. But they got these little fine, I mean, you can hardly see them. And I got a couple in my skin. You know what they did? They just sit there, and they festered. And I, I mean, I got the light up there. I go, no, 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 no. You know? And you can't even see them, and I'm trying to dig them out. But as long as they were there, for as small as they were there, they festered and they hurt. You see, when you allow, when you allow the smallest little lie to contradict the word of God, it will fester. It will be painful. Until you speak against it. And if you're not careful, then those little lies, those little thoughts will take root. And when they take root, the Bible says they eventually they'll bring you into captivity. That's why it's important we, we watch what we say. Now, I don't mean to be, and I don't like it when people are my word police. Oh, pastor, you know, I can't believe you said that. Well, let the Lord correct me. Let the Holy Spirit correct me. Now, if I ask you, you know, sometimes I've asked Pastor Mark, if you hear this come out of my mouth, just remind me, you know, what a doofus you are, you know? <laughs> And he does. He's faithful. He said, now that was pretty dumb, Pastor Mike. I can't believe you said that. I know. So, you know, you can find people to help you bring accountability into it. But you don't have to be the word police for everybody in your life. My mother was one of them. Every time you said something that she disagreed with or she thought was, went against the word of God, she was, she was sure to correct you. And there were times I would just say things just to say things just to get her response. And so don't be the word police for somebody else. Let the Holy Ghost be the word police. Hallelujah. Now, uh, and I'll give you an example. I don't go around, you know, I don't follow Pastor Kim. I do follow Pastor Kim because, man, she's my, my love of my life. But I don't follow her around the house being the word. Oh, don't say that. You can't say that. You know what she would tell me to do after a while? I can't repeat it in church, but it'd be something like uh, go fishing. Amen. Amen. She might even tell me to visit hell a few times. So we need to be careful. Let our belief be our belief. If people want help, hallelujah, we can help them. But most of the time, people don't want help. They don't want your help. Now, you'll hear me say things when you tell me something. Well, if you want me to agree with you, I'll agree with you. That's generally meaning that uh, what you just said is not quite. But if you want that, I'll agree with you for it. Do you want death and cursing and hell and all that into your life? Okay. That's your choice. That's what Proverbs tells us. The power of life and death is in your tongue. So take ownership of what God's already given you. Yes, amen. His promises are not no and maybe. His promises are yes and amen. Yes, amen. Get them in your heart. Get them in your mouth. Get them in your mind so that you begin to change the course of your life through the Word of God. God's not asking you to do anything that He hasn't done Himself. He uses faith to create the world. And when we saw when he framed the worlds, he spoke things into existence. Spoke. I'll tell you right now, some of you have spoken some things into existence and you're living in what you've spoken into existence and you don't lack it. And you're crying out to God, 
Why this? Why, 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 why? Because your mouth has been busy with your heart. Yeah, that's right. And you believe what you've been saying, and you've said it so often, you've framed something that doesn't, isn't supposed to exist in your life, but you've called it into existence. Yeah. You've called that lack into existence. I don't care if you have a job or you don't have a job, you have a career, or you don't have a career, you're retired or not. The Word of God is going to work the same. Just because you don't have a job doesn't mean you have to live in poverty and lack. That's right. Amen. Every time Pastor Mark has been unemployed, we agree with him to be employed. Now, you got a job, right? He got, remember we prayed last week? He got a job. He got a car. Somebody gave him a vehicle. Amen. Amen? <laughs> well, I'm glad you're declaring that. I'd hate to he hear you say something. Like, yeah, it's an old car. It's all beat up. <laughs> Don't run very well. <laughs> Amen. Amen? Doesn't matter how God and what God uses to meet your need as long as he meets the need. That's right. Hallelujah. That's... You know, in Pastor Mark and Pastor Sandy's life, a newer vehicle is a blessing right now. Amen. Right? They have kept their vehicles running a uh, long time, as we would say, long time. So, and here's something else I want to tell you. Because I just heard the Spirit of God say this. Well, that's Pastor Mark and Sandy. They did that. God did that because, you know, that's Pastor Mark and Sandy. God didn't do that because they're in the ministry. God did that because that's Mark and Sandy Hertzfeld. They're trusting God and they're believing God just like you are to have their needs met. God's no respecter of persons. What he's done for them, he'll do for you. Maybe you don't need to have a car given to you because the car you're driving is Get you around town pretty good. Pastor Mark and Pastor Sandy's cars are, well, they're getting them around town. Amen? Amen. But it's just time. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just time for a replacement. Yeah. Let's just call it what it is. Yeah. You can drive a vehicle until it's undrivable. <laughs> My mother-in-law did that with her Toyota Camry. We sold her our Toyota 1999 Camry in 2002. It had 100,000 miles on it. In three years, we put 100,000 miles on it. She drove that car for another 300,000 miles. It literally fell apart. But she got every penny out of that car. And so this time when it broke down, it was the timing chain. It was a couple other things. And they, you know, and it was going to cost her almost two grand to put that car back together. What does she do? She says, I need a new car. I think it's time. For, there's just sometimes it's just time to replace what you have because this, it needs to go to the cemetery, the car cemetery. Right? But you got to know that you know that you know. Pastor Kim and I have let cars go that we really love, but we knew that we need to let them go because that, you know, we knew that there was something wrong with something major and uh, it was going to be very costly. And any time that we've had to let a vehicle go, do you know that God has always given us a better vehicle? That's right. Amen. Amen. Begin declaring you know, my car runs, and it runs good. It stays on the road, gets good gas mileage. Maybe it don't get good gas mileage, but you know cars that don't get good gas mileage still can. God has a way. I, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard about. I, I remember one time, and, and I, one time, uh, yeah, I know this has probably never happened to you married men, but one time I got in a vehicle, and it was like, and I didn't have, I, I always look, but it was, it was below the E. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that in Pastor Kim's mind, that means exceptional gas value. <laughs> and when it gets in the red, well, I, I mean, we were out of gas. And we were out, we were, we were out, we were out in the country. <laughs> Had to believe God. Yeah, right. Trust God. That's right. I mean, and the, that, you know you're in trouble when it says, 
Uh, miles to empty, zero. But you see, that's why you got to know that we made it to the gas station. God will sustain you when you're running on empty. He will sustain you. Hallelujah. When you're running on empty, He will sustain you. But you know, if I'm always running on empty, that's not sustainability. I need to get the tank filled. Amen? So fill your tank. Fill your tank with the Word of God. Fill your tank with the thoughts of God. Fill your tank with the mind of God. How do you get the mind of God? You get God's Word on your insides so that when problems arise, you don't go, oh, 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 my goodness. What are we going to do now? I tell you, a couple months ago, when I tripped over that wheelbarrow, I, I, I guarantee you, I, I mean, if you would have seen my leg, you would have for sure thought it was broken in several places. I had, I had a goose egg that was about that big. I was out on the ranch by myself. Now you want to think about, okay, nobody there. Anxiety wanted to come in. Fear wanted to come in. I looked down at my leg and I said, uh-oh. But you know, the, when I tripped over that and I fell, as I'm, go, as I'm going, stop. As I'm going over, I'm calling out on the name of Jesus. And then when I looked down and I saw my leg, I said, you, the Bible says that he'll keep my, my bones from being broken. That's right. And yet you looked at my leg. I mean, it was swollen. I got home. The goose egg was gone. But pastor, but you know, I don't know if you've ever broken a foot. You know, it turns black and blue, like 50 shades of gray. And my leg, my leg from here down was, it, it, there wasn't one piece of white meat left. Ooh. And every time I looked at that, I, I thought, I, I better go get x-rays. I, I better go get x-rays. And on the inside of me, I just, no, nope, nope. And Pastor Kim says, man, you better go get x-rays. I, I said, nope, I just have that. And I had to call those things that be not. And it's just been recently since I've, that I've been able to put my boots back on. And my, that when I put my legs together, one doesn't, one doesn't look like a chicken foot and the other one looks like a pig foot. <laughs> but you see, what came out of my mouth was the Word of God. And every time I looked down, fear wanted to grip me. And I had to speak the Word. Maybe you're looking at your checkbook, and every time you look at your checkbook right now, fear wants to grip you. Right. It wants to grip you. But I want you to know that if you'll continue to speak to that checkbook, and you'll continue to call it full, it'll eventually line up with the Word of God. Because God promises that He'll take care of you. God promises that He'll supply every need according, if you're, every need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You're going to have to act like you already own a full checkbook. And I'm not talking about going out and doing stupid stuff like, hey, let's go bounce 100 checks. I got another faith check here. Woohoo! Yeah. But you, you continue, and God will give you increase. God will give you raises, promotions, bonuses, benefits. Yeah. I'll tell you, he'll open doors that, that, that are just miraculous because, yeah. you know, he's God? No, because you're standing on his word, and he'll watch over his word to perform it. He'll watch over His Word to perform it. He'll watch over His Word to perform it. I have a full supply. Yeah. I'm not a running on empty. I mean, my bills are paid and paid on time. Hallelujah. My cars are paid and paid on time. Yeah. Maybe that's your faith confession right now. Yeah. Oh, but stay with it. Yeah. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't buy into the lie and watch what you say. Oh, it's not working. I don't have it. I don't see it. You don't have to see it. Faith owns it. I don't have to see every car in my garage, but I know they're there. I don't have to go out in the garage and wonder, uh, I wonder if my car's there because I want to drive it. It's there. How do I know it's there? Unless Pastor Kim is driving it. I parked it there. I have a key. You don't have a key. I have a key. 
allows me entrance and exit. God has given you the keys to the kingdom. You can come and go as you please. That's right. Hallelujah. It's already yours. Yes. You've got the key. It's in your garage. Healing's in your garage. Provision is in your garage. Oh, sometimes, sometimes it seems like it's all locked away, but here's the good news. You've got a key. That's right. Go unlock it. That's right. Anybody got a refrigerator in their house? Just wondering. <laughs> right? Yes. On your refrigerators... When you stock it, when you go to it and open it, are you hoping that what you put in it is still there? Well, if you have teenage kids, yes. No, right? You know it's there. You go to the pantry and get what you need. If you're going to bake something, you get all of everything, the provision to bake what you need. God has already provided everything you need. It's in the pantry. All you got to do is go get it. Sometimes how I go get it, I say, Pastor Kim, will you bring me such and such? Sometimes I have to speak to get the need met. But if you'll speak the word of God, the need will be met. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Provision is yours. Ownership is yours. And I'm going to close with this thought. Now, we just said Pastor Mark has been given a, a vehicle. We're all hallelujah about that, right? What happens if he doesn't go get it? It's his. It's, our, it's been provided to him. He owns it. But if he doesn't go get it, he'll never have the benefits of that provision. If you never go get what God has already given you, you'll never walk in the benefits of what he's provided. And you'll always be in want. You'll always be in lack. Pastor Mark has got a car. And if he don't go get it, he ain't going to have a car. Eventually, his cars are going to just retire. Then he's going to be saying, you know, I got a car. If Tom gave me money, I won't say how much. I'll leave that up to you this week, Tom. <laughs> but if I don't go get it, he says, I got a check sitting here for you. Oh, and, and he said that check will cover all the bills of, of, of the church for 10 years. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> but if I don't go get it, now I know it's hypothetical. You'll, you'd write one for 20 years, right? So, if I don't go get it, the resource is there, the need has been met, but if I don't go get it, what happens? Well, we ain't got no money. If we only had money, we could pay the bills. Tom said, I've already written you a check, just come get it. Yeah, well... If I had more money, I could probably do this. I've got a check for you right here. Just come get it. Yeah, okay. I'm not taking and using the provision and the resources that have been provided. God's already provided you unlimited resources and provision. You just got to go get them. You've got to make a withdrawal. Right. And how do we do that? We withdraw from heaven through the words in which we speak, which align with God's word. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for speaking to the hearts of many that are here this morning. We thank you that your promises are yes and amen. And the provision of God has already been provided. It's not future tense, but it is now past tense because Jesus has already come in the flesh. He already paid the price. Help us to see more clearly. Help us to understand more deeply the revelation of your word in our mouth, how important these two are together and how they tie into creating an atmosphere for you to work in unconditionally. 
I like you, what you said in Isaiah, Father, that so, so shall your word go forth out of your mouth and it will not come back void, but it will accomplish that which is sent out to do and it will prosper in the area it's where it's been sent. In Hebrews, you said this. You said your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it pierces the dividing asunder of the spirit, the soul, and the body. Thank you that your word is alive. It's active. As we speak it, it begins to go and to do. Thank you, Father, that you said if we'd have just the amount of faith as the, scene of, uh, the, the size of a seed of a mustard seed, that we could move mountains. Holy Spirit, I just ask this morning that you continue to enlighten and bring revelation to the hearts of those within the sound of my voice concerning areas in their life, maybe that, as I have, have come up short in some areas. And as you've helped me to restructure, and you know, I, I like the scripture, Lord, whom the Lord loves, he, he corrects. You love me, so you, 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 you help me and you correct me. And so I'm asking for the same thing that you help those here within the sound of my voice, that you love them just as much as you love me. That if there's areas where they're coming up short, Holy Spirit, I ask you to reveal that to them, to help them, strengthen them and encourage them in their walk in faith. And then let them see, let them see how their faith is actually moving their mountains. And we ask all this this morning in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Maybe this morning, I know everybody that's in the house is and because of that, I know that each person has accepted Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior. But maybe you're watching this morning through any one of our social media platforms. And number one, maybe you've never heard a message like this. The importance of our words, the importance of faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter uh, 10, verses 9 and 10, that if we'll openly declare with our mouth, again, it comes back to declaration or confession, will openly declare with our mouth, mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We will be made whole. So we see the, the attributes or the law of faith and operation, declaration and believing in our heart. And by doing that, we move over into salvation. Salvation is being removed from the kingdom of darkness, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. The Bible says, behold, all things become new. Internally, you see, man is a triune being, spirit, soul, and body. So even the spirit becomes new. The soul and the body are the same as you ever have. But when we accept Jesus Christ, God removes a dead, lifeless spirit out of us that is separated from him and puts in a new spirit that's alive unto him eternally. When we die... When we draw our last breath upon the face of the earth, we are eternally going somewhere. We're an eternal being. We're our spirit, we're soul, and then we're body. So eternally, we're going to depart this physical, temporal body, and we're going to go somewhere. The choice becomes yours. God gives us a choice. He gives us a free will to choose him because we want to be part of his kingdom and because we love him. He's not a dictator. He's not a commander that just says, you will serve me or else. That's not our God. That's not love. And God is love. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior this morning, I want to give you that opportunity right now to become part of his family, become part of the family of love. For when we do that, our life takes on a different meaning. We're eternally separated from the kingdom of darkness and we're moved into the kingdom of life. And so when we draw our last breath in, we're not separated from God. We are part of the family of God, which allows us entrance into heaven. Without Jesus, and, and, and the Bible says in John 14, 16, that, that no man can come to the Father, Jesus said this, except through me. Without Jesus, we are eternally separated from 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 the Father, which equals eternal death or eternal damnation. 
And because we are eternally separated, we are not allowed into the presence of God because of the sin nature that we have. Sin can't stand in the presence of God. But Jesus came and he provided a way for us so that we could be sin free through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. And so he removed our sin. You know, there's an old, old, old story that, or old song that says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Yes, I was a sinner. And yes, I was saved by grace. And though I may sin from time to time, God doesn't see me as a sinner. He now sees me as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm in right standing. My sin has been washed away. I'm cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and I've made anew. This morning, if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, pray this prayer with me right now. Father, Father. in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. I openly declare what I believe in my heart, that you were raised from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm born again, I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, Pastor Kim and I would like to welcome you into the kingdom of heaven. I know that something wonderful and special and spectacular is happening to you right now. You may not understand it, but that's Jesus introducing himself to you. I'm going to encourage you to do two things. Number one, find yourself a good Bible-believing church. If you're in the San Antonio area, we believe His Grace Church is such a place. We're a smaller body of believers, uh, or as they used to say on Cheers, where everybody can know your name. It's a good place to come get hooked up. Man, uh, our, our whole emphasis is on teaching and training you and developing people uh, to grow and mature in the things of God. And so not only are we a, a community of believers, but, but we do a lot of things socially t- together as well. We hang out. We're like a family. We, and everybody just hangs out. and We do things together. We, we have social events. So if you're looking for a socialization aspect of a church, man, you can't ask for more. You have the spiritual and the social. So come be a part of what we're doing. Come check us out here at His Grace Church, 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway. The other thing I encourage you to do is check out our website at www.hgc.church or hgcchurch.com. Under digital resources, you're going to apply, find a plethora of learning material. But I want to draw your attention to uh, the very first one on that page, and that's going to be the new birth. Pastor Kim and I put that together. Uh, it's about mm, 10 videos, five to seven minutes per video. It's a very short uh, series. It wasn't designed for any real in-depth teaching, but just to give you an executive level synopsis of what's occurred this morning in your life. So check it out, and then come be a part of what we're doing here at His Grace Church. Amen. Uh, Pastor uh, Sandy has got prayer Tuesday morning from 7 to 8 8 p.m. 10 to 11 a.m. Amen. You know, a church that prays together stays together. Yeah. And so I encourage you, come be a part of uh, uh, corporate prayer. If you don't know really how to pray, this is a good place to come because the um, way we learned to pray is we went to prayer school and we prayed with our spiritual father. And um, it's a good place to come learn, to grow, develop in a manner of praying with the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the Holy Spirit Uh, Because, you know, he has things he wants to do in the earth, in the church, in the nations. And he needs, I think it was Howard Carter said that, that nothing, that God can do nothing except by prayer first. And so we encourage you to come and um, be a part of prayer. And man, we're seeing great things because of the faithfulness of prayer here at the house as well. So um, then again, Saturday, we have our social, uh, our social Gathering at the house begins at 11.30. If you're not familiar where we're located, uh, send us a text, email, and um, it's going to be a brisket and all kinds of other good stuff. So that's Saturday beginning at 11.30 a.m. And then if you haven't already, check out our social media platforms. Subscribe to us, follow us, like us. We're on Facebook. We post on, on 
X, which is formerly Twitter. We have our own YouTube channel, and we are also on Rumble. So, man, do what it does. Check us out. Follow us. Like us. Heart us. Man, I, uh, I want to thank all of our YouTube subscribers because we've... I know it doesn't sound big, but we're, we're at 99. We need one more to make 100. So like us. Um, subscribe to our channel. Um, <clears throat> it, it's really helpful. Hallelujah. So, and we've grown, we've grown all of our social media organically. So we're not paying people to have names placed. It's all uh, word of mouth. So check us out. Come be a part of what we're doing here at His Grace Church. Hallelujah. And then uh, Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week. And that is, come check out Amplify. <laughs> Forgot about Amplify. 7 p.m. every Thursday night. We're returning up the heat with practical teaching for everyday living. We hear it, we see it, and then we live in the Word of God. And we're going to continue teaching on how to live a good life. How to live that life that God has promised you uh, financially. Amen. So, Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something good and unique to say to you this week, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Man, thanks for being part of this broadcast. Thanks for everybody who came out this morning to support the work of the ministry. And you know, I'm Pastor Michael Pilmore, just in case you don't know who I am, and you're watching His Grace Church, which is the destination for divine visitation. I'll see you right back here Thursday night for Amplify. <laughs>